Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to this session in which we're going to feature uh, this year's uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in Research uh, awardee. Um, it's great pleasure for me to introduce Lucy to, for this afternoon's talk. Um, she clearly is a figure in the field of HCI and CSW who really sort of transformed how we think about what we do. She was one of the very first to bring the sort of anthropological perspective into our field, into the heart of our field, and has just been an influential presence ever since. Um, her pioneering work when she was first at uh, what then was called Xerox Park, uh, and a series of studies of a variety of interesting work situations that uh, have informed us in, in a great measure about both substantive issues but also methodological issues. And uh, she's just been the kind of person who just keeps influencing how we think and how we uh, frame things. Um, I especially uh, like the fact that um, just recently she published a sort of uh, expanded and updated version of her classic book, Plans and Situated Actions, called Human Machine Reconfigurations, colon, Plans and Situated Actions. And it's, to me, a kind of remarkable publication because kind of the center of the book is the original book but then it's framed by additional chapters on both sides, plus commentary woven in, so sort of reflecting how things have evolved over the years since that extremely influential book first appeared. So it's with great pleasure I introduce Lucy and... Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gary, and I want to start just by um, thanking um, Sighai for this, this really wonderful honor. Um, I really am, oh, I thought I turned off my screensaver, but I'll just have to keep uh, tickling it. Um, I, I am really moved uh, to be the recipient of this award, um, and uh, this has been one of the more difficult talks that I've given in a long time because I keep thinking of different directions that it could go in. Every time I see someone else in the audience, I think, oh, I really, that person is gonna want me to talk about this, and so I've had to make some very difficult choices, and I hope, I hope it won't be disappointing. Um, one other qualification um, influenced by some of the talks that I've uh, heard this morning, uh, in particular, and uh, at other times in the conference, there's clearly a growing awareness um, in, at CHI about location uh, and the specificity um, of our locations. And the work that I've done has been some from very specific um, geopolitical uh, historical locations. Uh, so I'm talking from uh, what I've called before the hyper-developed world, um, what, what Gary Marsden this morning called the over-developed world. Uh, so um, that I think is, uh, it, it, it defines a lot of what I'm, the kinds of technologies I'm gonna be talking about, the kinds of issues and experiences. It's a limitation um, that, I, that I want to acknowledge, but, but that's gonna be part of um, my, my point. Um, so what I really want to try to do is uh, I want to um, try to avoid um, being uh, autobiographical. I want to try to avoid any kind of nostalgia. Um, I really want to try to rather uh, talk about um, the kinds of conceptual issues, um, uh, observations uh, that, that, have, that I've found most exciting in thinking about um, what's happening at the interface of, uh, of persons and machines, bodies, uh, and technologies. Um, so when, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is what I'm calling here agencies uh, at the interface, and I'll say more about what I mean um, by agencies. I've put up this, this image here, which I'm going to come back to, um, but it's, it's just a kind of icon for the, the, the things that I want to be attending to. So we have um, a body, uh, which is only partly revealed. Most of the body is off the screen, out of the frame, and that's going to be an important part of what I want to be talking about. How do we frame what constitutes the interface? Um, and there's no um, one right answer for that. It's always, um, it depends, it's a, it's a, it's, these, are, these are choices that we make, either wittingly or unwittingly, so we've got to draw some boundaries, we've got to make some frames. So, but we've got this body. Um, the body is actually, it's a hand that's holding uh, an artifact, a non-digital artifact. It's very difficult to see, I know, but she's holding a pen, uh, and she's using the pen to highlight something um, on the screen, which, she's, which she is narrating, um, talking to us about. 
Um, and on the screen is a computer-aided design rendering um, of a highway intersection, uh, which she's working on. Um, and so it's this uh, assemblage of uh, bodies, artifacts, both um, uh, digital and non-digital um, representations and the things um, that they uh, are being uh, treated as standing for at any given moment that together um, make up the kinds of um, layerings uh, that, that, uh, that constitute um, the, the, the human machine interface. Um, and it's that question of what's uh, both there uh, inside and what's outside our unit of analysis um, at any given moment um, that I want to, uh, to reflect on um, as I go through uh, my talk. Um, now I have to do a little bit of autobiography, I'm afraid, because um, I have to take you back to the, tech, the, the machine uh, with which um, it all started for me, uh, the, 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 the humble um, photocopier, uh, and uh, I have not spent my whole life studying Xerox machines as I recently read on a blog somewhere, but, um, <laughs> but I did start with, with the Xerox machine, um, and, uh, and, and this is also a story that I want to tell because it's been misrepresented um, so many times in, I think, a very interesting way. The misrepresentation is that somehow I am responsible for having given uh, industrial designers at Xerox the idea of putting a green button on the photocopier. And that this, is, this really is my life achievement. This would be... <laughs> This would be, according to these stories, the things for which I'm currently, um, be, the thing that I'm being given um, an award for today. Now, you know, <laughs> much as I would like to claim that, um, I have to explain that that is actually antithetical to the story that I would really like to tell. Um, because what happened was that at, in, in the early days, um, the, in, soon after my arrival uh, at Xerox Park, um, this is the, the early 1980s, um, Xerox put this machine uh, out on the market. This is the 8200 copier. Um, it was an interesting machine because it was put out on the market very quickly. Um, Kodak had just put out a machine at a comparable uh, market niche and Xerox had to get something out very quickly. Um, the machine uh, was codenamed Chainsaw during its development um, because it was made of, you know, bits and pieces that were um, taken from other machines and, and cobbled together. But the other thing about it was that it was occupying um, a, a new kind of uh, market niche. Uh, that is, it was the first uh, machine that was uh, at the time, very feature rich. It had things like an automatic document handler, which believe it or not was, was quite a cutting edge technology. Uh, it could do two-sided copying and so forth. Um, and, and it was a machine that rather than being marketed to uh, so-called dedicated users, um, a wonderful term, uh, which basically means people who are paid to operate a photocopier, um, it was being marketed as a machine for the so-called casual user. Uh, another phrase that I, that I love because, of course, people who use photocopiers are very rarely casual. They're usually extremely stressed out. Um, but, but the idea of the casual user is that this is not a person whose life is centered on the operation of a photocopier, but rather somebody who, in the course of their, their life, otherwise preoccupied, uh, with different things has to um, make some copies. So this machine was marketed for the casual user and it came to, uh, to us at Park um, as a problem. Um, and the problem was that uh, customers were complaining that they could not figure out how to operate it. Um, this at, and, and in this context, um, a, a project emerged uh, at Park, which, which came to be known as the Operability Project. Um, and, and it started out, um, my, my interest was in the question, when people said, this machine is too complicated, what actual experience were they reporting um, in that? What, what did they mean by that? What had happened? Uh, and so the, the first thing that we did, and Austin and I, uh, Austin Henderson and I did this, was we went out to some customer locations where people had, uh, this machine was installed and we sort of hung around the photocopier. We watched people and we saw people come along and, you know, they came full of hope and they, 
took their job and they found the recirculating document handler and they pressed the buttons on the interface and they pressed the green start button and they went hopefully to the output end of the machine and something came out that had no intelligible relationship to what they had thought um, they had asked the machine to do. Um, and then of course they turned to Austin and me and they said, well, you know, you're from Xerox, what's going on? And we said, oh, well, but we're from research. <laughs> And, uh, and that was very helpful. And, and we then explained that, that we were ourselves not familiar with this machine, and we were trying to understand what was going on. Uh, and, and what we realized was that we were never going to be able to figure it out unless we could, in a way, bring this machine back from the wild into the lab. Um, and so and after many, many uh, labors, and a whole interesting story in itself to actually get a photocopier into PARC as a research object, um, we installed um, a, a, one of these copiers uh, at PARC, um, and we made a series of videotapes. Um, we basically asked our colleagues if they would be willing, uh, if they had something they wanted to copy, would they be willing to come and try to do it using this photocopier and let us um, make videotapes of them. Um, and we, uh, they, were, they were very helpful, um, and uh, perhaps the most famous of these trials, um, this is a, a still image from it, uh, and some of you may recognize the person on the right from the top of his head as Alan Newell, uh, one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, and with him is Ron Kaplan, a very brilliant computational linguist, and Ron is trying to make a two-sided copy of one of his papers for Alan and, and after an hour and a half, they have not succeeded uh, in doing this. Although they have hypothesized, theorized, modeled um, this machine, you know, inside and out. Um, and this, uh, this, a bit of this videotape um, was incorporated into uh, a video that was actually created uh, for John C. Lee Brown's keynote um, at, I believe it was Chi 1986, uh, something like that. Um, and uh, the, the point um, that I was really interested in making uh, was that, that despite the, the, the sophistication uh, of these users, because uh, we couldn't have found more sophisticated uh, users technologically, what was going on here was about an encounter with an unfamiliar artifact. And it, while it is very consequential what you bring to such an encounter, you will always face the, the work of actually coming into some kind of familiarity with that artifact. That work can't be alleviated. And it definitely can't be alleviated through um, advertisements that claim that all you need to, to do in order to operate this machine is to push the green button, which was the thrust um, of this advertisement. So the, the, the analysis in that respect is counter to the message that's being conveyed here um, that says that that any, I mean, there were many, many things that could be done to improve the interface to this machine. Um, but our argument was that however improved, it would never completely eliminate the requirement that people actually had to spend some time developing a relationship uh, to any, that, and that's true for all of us whenever we encounter something that is, um, that is unfamiliar. Um, but another project that emerged uh, from this, and, and don't worry if you can't read this because it's the form, the structure that's important, uh, was a project where, uh, led by um, our colleague Richard Fikes to try to create an expert system that could serve as a kind of instructor in the operation uh, of this machine. Um, and I then did a series of analyses of people's encounters with the machine now using this expert system interface. And uh, the, the important point here is simply that in doing that analysis, I developed a very simple template which became tremendously uh, helpful. Um, and so basically what this is, is four columns. Um, on the far left uh, is a transcript of, and, and in many cases we had two people trying to do this together because then they were talking to each other about what they thought was going on. So the left-hand column is all the things that those two people were saying to each other um, and a lot of the things that they were doing uh, to and around the machine. Um, the next column over uh, is the very, very tiny subset of all the things that they were doing that actually um, 
were, were available to the machine. And that is those things they did that actually changed the machine's state, because that's all it could tell about what was going on. And by transcribing in those two columns, it immediately became obvious what, a, again, what a very, very small, it's as if the machine was looking through this tiny little pinhole um, at what was going on. Um, in the third column over are the changes uh, in the expert system interface in response to those changes um, in the machine state created by the users. And then finally, in the fourth column, the design logic such that given this action on the part of the user, it makes sense um, to give this as a next instruction. Uh, so in a way, it's the two columns in the middle that are the human machine interface narrowly defined. This is the place where uh, there's actually contact between the user and the machine. And the columns uh, on, the, on the edges then elaborate uh, what's going on from the from the user's point of view and from the machine's point of view in some respect. And by doing this kind of transcription, um, I was able to see the many moments at which those communications became misaligned and to diagnose the reasons for that misalignment and basically to come away with a much deeper appreciation for what an incredibly hard problem it is to create an interactive interface um, and to realize that there were some serious um, differences, um, asymmetries in the kinds of resources that were available uh, to the, well, most importantly uh, to me as an observer of this, making use of this full range of resources uh, and the machine uh, attempting to make sense of what was going on uh, based on this very, very, very limited um, subset. Uh, so the takeaway message of of that analysis and of the book that followed, um, uh, Plans and Situated Actions, I want to try to present to you in this slide. Um, so the idea is that there, there are things in the world that we can uh, call prescriptive representations. Um, there, there are things that are basically uh, normative, they're telling us um, what, what we should do. And there's just a plethora of those. Um, so in, I was particularly engaging with, um, with work in artificial intelligence around planning, uh, plan in, plans, instructions, scripts, uh, policies, procedures, recipes, interfaces themselves. Uh, and the point is that all of these things, I think, are very usefully thought about as artifacts. These are discursive artifacts, often realized in various kinds of material forms. Um, and the interesting question, I think, for us is, what is the work of the production and use of these artifacts? And, in, and very importantly, what's the relationship between the places in which they get created um, and the places in which they are supposed to then be implemented, put into practice, realized. Um, what, what are the politics of those relations? And what, are, what is the work of, on the one hand, anticipating, from the design point of view, um, what, what's going to be uh, involved in reading these um, prescriptive representations, and on the other hand, actually reading and enacting um, these kinds of prescriptive representations. And so this is, this is the basic argument of plans and situated actions, that all forms of prescripti prescriptive representation are actually both embedded in, created through, and then uh, put into use in, in, in the course of, uh, enacted through, um, very specifically and differently um, situated uh, practices. And it's that relation between design and use the complexity, the challenges, the difficulties of that relationship that make up a lot of the problem of designing uh, interactive, designing any kind of interfaces um, and, and interactivity then adds some interesting dimensions, which I'll come back to. So um, as Gary very kindly mentioned, um, in 2007, 20 years after the original publication uh, of Plans and Situated Actions, I published this uh, expanded uh, edition. Um, and this uh, cover image, I'm, I'm very, very fond uh, of this cover image. Um, it basically is a, it's an image from a, an ancient um, 
13th century manuscript of automata um, by a, an Arab scholar uh, named Al-Jazari. Um, he wrote, uh, he, he published this book, it had 50 different automata in it. Uh, and this particular uh, one is called A Device for Washing Hands. And this is a uh, description uh, of the device. Water flows from the bill of the peacock. Meanwhile, one of the doors opens and a child comes out holding a soap jar in his hand. When the, when the flow of water stops, the other door opens and a child comes out holding a towel in his hand. So what I like about this device is that it configures um, a human figure. Um, and, uh, and an animal figure with what are clearly built objects of some kind, um, but where it's kind of difficult to tell uh, what's natural and what's artificial and who exactly is doing what to whom. Um, and I like the figure then for its obviousness as some kind of machine, uh, but also for the ambiguities uh, of its configuration in terms of what kind of distributions are going on here uh, between humans and non-humans, um, and it's those questions um, that I've become increasingly um, interested in. And so what I want to, to really do uh, in the remainder of my talk is to think about those questions um, of relations between humans and non-humans using some of the resources that have come out of recent work in science and technology studies, uh, an interdisciplinary um, field of social sciences, uh, thinking about science and technology, which I've been, um, been involved with uh, very actively over uh, my whole life, but particularly over the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, and it's this question of how we think about agencies, by which I mean simply capacities for action, as distributed across humans and non-humans, persons um, and machines. Now, a little bit of conceptual work on this, and then I promise I'm going to get to examples very quickly. Um, but this, I want to just pause for a minute with this idea of reconfiguration, because it's a word that I love. I think it's, it's, it's full of all sorts of, of uh, very generative um, readings. Um, and what I'm going to be emphasizing throughout here um, is this relationship that I'm indicating at the bottom of this slide between, on the one hand, what I'm calling here cultural imaginaries, by which I just mean the collective conceptual experiential resources that we have um, to think about the possibilities um, of the world, and on the other hand, material practices. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm interested in the inseparability of those two things, how our cultural imaginaries are always informed by the kinds of material practices um, that we that we participate in, and those practices in turn are always informed by the possibilities for thinking that are available to us. Um, so this idea of reconfiguration for me starts out with this core, the figure, uh, or the idea of the figural. That is the idea that, that there's nothing in the world really that's literal. Even the most um, technical, the most mathematical language is full of, of metaphors, tropes, turns of phrase. We're always, we're always thinking metaphorically, um, and that's absolutely central. And so the question is, what are the metaphors, what are the concepts that are available to us? Um, Donna Haraway, uh, historian of science, has, I think, very usefully suggested that we might think about technologies uh, as what she calls materialized figurations. So they're things that concretize, that realize um, the kinds of, of collective uh, imaginaries um, that we have. Um, and then, of course, we can think about the question of how persons and things or humans and machines are configured or figured in relation to each other. And it's really that, how do we think about the similarities and differences and the relationships between people and machines um, that I'm, uh, I'm really most interested in. And then, of course, uh, how, what, are, what possible reconfigurations might th there be? How might they be uh, figured together in different ways? Um, so that's the, the kind of uh, conceptual terrain uh, that I want to explore. But, but as I promised, I, I want to now make that much more concrete. 
So I'm gonna start uh, with this somewhat shocking image. Um, when, I, when I show this image outside the United States, uh, in the UK now I have to explain um, the text on the sides of the image. I trust I probably don't have to do that for most of you. You'll recognize it as the slogan of the National Rifle Association. Um, so this is an argument about the response of the agency, the capacities for action, and how they're distributed between people and things. So the argument is, um, guns are innocent. Uh, it's people who have the agency and, and people who we should be worried about. And in the center is, uh, for people of my generation anyway, an iconic image. Uh, this is the moment when Lee Harvey Oswald, who had been uh, accused of assassinating um, John F. Kennedy, was being transferred on national television live from one facility to another. And we're, we were all watching television and out into the frame uh, comes uh, Jack Ruby, the guy in the hat, and he assassinates um, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, as we are all watching. So I, I'm gonna, I put this uh, iconic image of the use of the gun um, in front of you, and then I wanna read um, a, a very brief passage from Bruno Latour's book, Pandora's Hope, where he uses the gun um, as a way of thinking about the question of, of agency and responsibility between people um, and things. And this is what he, he writes. He says, you are different with a gun in your hand. The gun is different with you holding it. You are another subject because you hold the gun. The gun is another object because it has entered into a relationship with you. The gun is no longer the gun in the armory or the gun in the drawer or the gun in your pocket but the gun in your hand. If we study the gun and the person together, we realize that neither subject nor object is fixed. When the two are articulated, they become someone slash something else. So it's this um, image uh, and this, this argument that I really want to take as the, the core here. Uh, it's an argument about what we take to be the unit of analysis. Um, and the argument is that when we think about people and things, rather than thinking about either one of them uh, as having some kind of intrinsic attributes, the really interesting question is what happens when they get joined together? And what new kinds of capacities for action are available as we get new configurations of people and machines? And if we want to think about questions of responsibility, of agency, that's got to be our unit of analysis. We've got to be thinking in terms of configurations. We've got to be thinking in terms of particular assemblages of people uh, and, and technology. Okay, so let me give you some more examples just to elaborate on this. And these, are, again, are examples from contemporary work in science and technology studies that I think are really exciting. Um, this is, and, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples from, from medicine, from high-tech medicine, uh, a place where these, these issues um, become particularly uh, salient and, and dramatic. So this is a, a project done by a colleague of mine at Lancaster. She was a, a nurse, a, a surgical nurse, um, worked in anesthesiology, and she decided to come back and get a PhD. Um, <clears throat> and she did a, a really uh, wonderful study of the work of anesthesiology. But she, she ended up thinking about it in a very interesting way because she was thinking about it through the lens of, of contemporary um, STS. Uh, and her argument is that we should really think about um, the work of, of anesthesiology as, as a kind of three-stage uh, process of redistribution of agency. So we start out, we have a, a person, a body, that has the capacity to sustain its own vital functions. So this is a really basic, fundamental form of agency. And the job of the anesthesiologist is to effectively redistribute that capacity to, to support vital functions out of the body of the patient and into this complex array of, of people and machines that, that constitutes the, the surgery, the theater. Um, and so that redistribution into this new kind of socio-technical network is done and very importantly sustained by the anesthesiologist over the course of the surgery and then the third phase, of course, very important, is when the surgery is over, effectively 
reincorporating that capacity for action back into the body of the patient. Um, and she makes a, an, a very important observation about that middle phase because she says it's in that middle phase, it's not that the patient becomes inactive. Uh, the patient is still a very active part of this assemblage. They're generating all sorts of information. Um, but that information is, be, is effective only as it's read through all of the machines that are monitoring and, and the feedback um, that is being carefully uh, adjusted by, by the skilled practitioners um, in the room. So it's a different kind of sociotechnical assemblage where, again, the patient doesn't disappear, but their agency, their capacities for action are very, very radically redistributed. So a very dramatic example, I think, of something that we can think of many other less dramatic examples of um, in, in the ways that, uh, that, that technology um, is enter, that we enter into relationships get configured in relation to technology. Um, another example, again, from surgery, um, and I like, this is from uh, Rachel Prentice's work, and she's been looking at robotically assisted minimally invasive surgery. Um, so this is an image uh, in the background. On the left, you have the surgeon who seemingly is like looking off in another direction <laughs> from where the action is. Um, but of course, uh, what's going on here is that the surgeon is operating um, through these robot arms, very, very, very delicate instruments and performing the surgery. And what I, what I really love about Rachel's work is that um, she gets us away from any simple ideas of, of, of proximity as involving a closer relationship and distance a, a farther, more distant relationship, because the surgeons that she talks to report that when they, particularly surgeons she talks to who, who've done also traditional surgery where you cut the person open and you literally, you know, you have your hands inside them. So in some ways you think, well, that's a much more intimate relationship. But these surgeons describe their experience uh, in, the, in the, uh, the assisted surgery as being actually much more intimately engaged because they are able to kind of project themselves inside the body of the patient. So they're in there sort of doing their work. Um, so actually, uh, counterintuitively, um, the mediation, the technological mediation configures an even more intimate uh, relationship between these two bodies. And I think that's just a really, um, really interesting uh, an important observation to complicate, and, and probably one less surprising to you all than it is to some of the STS audiences, um, because you're you're aware of the po those kinds of the, those possibilities. Um, but again, it's a really important complication to how we think about proximity uh, and distance and and mediation. Um, another, uh, I think, very compelling and and a little bit less. Um, positive example comes from Natasha Schul, who's been looking at compulsive gambling, and particularly video, what's going on with the introduction of digital technologies uh, into, um, into gambling, um, and the, the assemblage of, um, from, from the ergonomics of chairs, so that what can you do to make it possible for people to sit for longer periods of time without experiencing any kind of bodily discomfort, um, to the, the video gambling machines with more and more sophisticated algorithmic processes for uh, adjusting to the rate of play, for elaborating um, the, the game play. Um, and her, so her, her study combines looking at the whole gambling industry, at the design of everything from casinos to gambling machines, talking to a lot of compulsive gamblers, and really articulating um, what they call being in the zone. This tremendous desire not to win, because actually it's very annoying if somebody comes over and interrupts you and tries to give you money, um, but rather to, to be, as they say, in the zone, to, to be in this incredibly intimate uh, relationship where you're 
your sense of your body boundaries uh, basically disappears and you are completely incorporated um, into this very, very, very dynamic um, interactive relationship uh, with, with the technology. Um, so again, it's a site where I think there are a lot of really important political, economic, uh, critical analyses that we need to do of, of what's going on here and for whose benefit, uh, but also a site where the question of body technology relationships and the kinds of dynamics that, that uh, digital interfaces um, make possible uh, is, is very, again, very, very dramatically, um, I think, uh, in evidence. So then just to return briefly um, to this uh, image that I opened with, which comes from, from um, a study that I did as part of a project just before uh, I left PARC, um, a, a work practice and participatory design project, but within, it was with a group of civil engineers um, who were involved in uh, a bridge project uh, in the Bay Area. And this was a, a small study with Andrea, one of the civil engineers, just trying to understand her work uh, with her CAD system. And the point that I just want to make here, and, and Susanna Bodker's work, um, Susanna Bodker wrote a book called Through the Interface, uh, making the argument that uh, that when, I mean, it's an argument now that I think is very familiar, that we become aware of the interface at moments when either it's unfamiliar or it's broken down, but when we are, again, configured um, into an effective kind of uh, relationship uh, with our technology, then we work through the interface. It's not the interface itself, it's the things that we're engaged with. Um, and CAD is a very interesting example of that because in some ways it could be seen as the ultimate example of a sort of abstracted, formalized um, representation of things in, in the world, objects in the world. But in looking at what's happening when a, a, it's a skilled engineer like Andrea is actually working with CAD, it's clear that there's, there's something much more interesting going on. Uh, she, this, as I said, is a, is a rendering of a particular intersection, particularly tricky intersection that she's working on on one side of this bridge. It's an intersection that is, has all sorts of complex um, difficulties of infrastructure, of toxic um, waste that's buried underneath, of, of parts of the community that are disrupted. Um, and in her work with, with, the, with the CAD, uh, she's constantly um, referring, as she talks it, us through it, to objects that she knows in, through all sorts of other means. So she's been out to this site. She's walked around underneath um, this, uh, this, this highway exchange. Um, she's been at endless meetings where all of the, the contested, uh, controversial, difficult aspects of this have been discussed. Um, and when she's working with her CAD station, all of those things are very much alive. At the same time, she's able to do things here that she can't do anywhere else. She's able to engage with this highway and this intersection here in ways that she couldn't do through any of those other means. So it's both a very unique and, and, uh, and, and specific place uh, a very specific kind of configuration that gives again, her, again, very specific capacities for action, but where what she can do here is absolutely essentially tied to all sorts of other forms of her practice and ways of knowing um, the object that she's working on. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, now, I just want to, um, to turn uh, in, in the, the, the last part of, of my talk um, to a question that I've been preoccupied by um, for a very long time uh, coming out of this work. Um, and, and I reference it here um, in, in, as a kind of anthropological problem articulated by Alfred, Alfred Gell, um, wonderful anthropologist, um, who points out, as he says, since the outset of the discipline, anthropology has been signally preoccupied with a series of problems to do with ostensibly peculiar relations between persons and things which somehow appear as or do duty as persons. So this to me is a connection between my longstanding interests in the, uh, the project of creating various kinds of human-like capacities for action uh, in our interfaces um, and 
again, a, to, to contextualize this in terms of a, of a much more long-standing, uh, in this case, anthropological problem. Um, and, and this come, takes us back to the questions of interactivity that were part of the, the early um, work that I did and, and my early engagements with AI. Um, and I want to give you a recent example, and um, I, I showed this example in a talk at the Media Lab last year, so some of you will have seen it. Um, this is, and, and this is a, an, an example of, a, again, of, a, of a, an artifact, um, particularly a, it's a, a, a version of a conversational interface, um, a, an agent-based interface um, created by the artist Stellark. Um, so it's uh, Stellark's prosthetic head. Uh, it's basically a very nice 3D uh, rendering of Stellark's head. Um, and you, uh, this, this um, head was uh, installed in a gallery in Toronto in 2003. Um, and I went, because I have this long-standing interest in conversational agents, to see what it was that Stellark um, had come up with. Um, and as you can see, the head was displayed in this dark room, very, very large display, and you stood um, at a podium, very much like this one, with a keyboard, and the head was directly opposite from you, and you engaged um, in a very Eliza-like conversation with the head. Um, but what made this particular uh, day interesting was the fact that Stellark was also present because this was one of the first exhibitions of the head and he was curious, very curious to see what would happen when people went to use it. So what I'm going to play for you is a brief excerpt uh, from my interactions with, with Stellark's head, with Stellark um, next, he's, he's just off the screen to the right, um, basically coaching me on what to, how best to engage uh, in interaction with this head. So I'm going to play it. It'll be a, a, probably a bit hard to hear, but I, then I'll take you through three moments um, that I think are particularly uh, interesting. <laughs> Can it recite any philosophers or commentators? For example, you ask if one's reduction in the head. Why doesn't he have feelings? He said, why don't you have any feelings? Okay. 
can It depends on what you mean by thinking. <laughs> okay, so I realize that's difficult to hear and see, so let me just point out a few moments here that I particularly like. So as I said, um, Stellark is there kind of uh, advising me on things that I might ask. Um, and so he says uh, at the very beginning, it also has a simple way of generating poetry on the fly. It has a sample database of about 50 words. You can say, recite a poem. And so I type, recite a poem, please. Uh, and Stellar continues, it'll basically put together a bunch of words that, and then the head interrupts him. We could talk about that, uh, very interesting. But, uh, and the head says, your polite style is very nice. Our breathing, imploding, breathing, imploding, city, body, electric, system, city, excessive, replicating, and city, city, involuntary, imploding. And then it smiles at me. Um, and I say, oh, that was very nice. Uh, and then I type very nice. And the head says, thanks, still Lucy. Now, it's the thanks, still Lucy that I want to pause at because this is one of those moments when the, the machinery leaks through. Um, What's happened is that the way the head works is that when I walk up to the podium, there's a touch-sensitive pad, uh, and my stepping on the pad effectively wakes up the head, initiates a new encounter, um, and uh, you know, as most of these conversational agents does, it asks me for my name, and I, I give it my name. Now it turns out that the the the, the uh, touchpad was, of course, um, acting up on this particular day. And so at one point in our interaction, the head had uh, gone to sleep, and Stellark had explained that the best fix for this was for me to step off and then step back onto the pad. So I did this, and of course, the head then asked me my name. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm still Lucy. And so then it called me still Lucy um, forever after. So again, it's, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of nice things we could do here um, around that. But, but it's the, it, the, so that's a moment of the machinery kind of leaking through. But then there are other moments, these, these moments of wonderful sort of alignment. Um, so this is the one, this is the moment where um, the observer, uh, camera person says, can it recite any philosophers or commentators? And Stellark says, well, for example, if you ask it, what is reductionism? Now we all laugh because, of course, we love the reflexive idea of getting a robot head to, to discuss reductionism. Uh, and I say, what is reductionism? And the head says, reductionism is the philosophy that all psychology reduces to biology, all biology to chemistry, chemistry to physics, physics to mathematical logic. Therefore, according to reductionism, I can understand you by means of logic alone without having a human brain. Um, then there's this comment about emergent properties. And so I type, do you believe in reductionism? And the head says, yes, I believe in it, do you? And I say, I'm not sure, and the head very disarmingly says, is there anything I can say to help you make up your mind? Now, of course, you know, all of you who are familiar with Eliza-like programs know that this is an easy kind of stock phrase. Somebody says, I'm not sure, and regardless of what the context is, um, this is an appropriate uh, next thing to say. And so we get, we get a lot of pleasure out of, out of those uh, moments. And the final one, which is my favorite, um, is I uh, ask the head, uh, do you have feelings? And the head says, as a robot, I do not have any human emotion. My apparent emotional responses are simply algorithms designed to make me easier to interact with. And then I say, do you think robots should have emotions? And the head says, that depends on what you mean by thinking, which is this lovely moment where, of course, I'm after the question of affect and emotion, and the head um, gets stuck on this prior question, perfectly legitimate one, <laughs> and one very appropriate uh, for its own uh, existential situation. Um, the, what I came away from this encounter with um, was, again, a very strong sense for, for the question of, of frames um, and, and boundaries. Um, and because it, it was clear that, uh, first of all, the exhibition of the head 
itself was very carefully staged, very carefully framed. Uh, it was tremendously enriched by the fact that Stellark was there. It would have been a much less interesting um, encounter if he hadn't been. And over the course of the hour or so that, that, that we engaged, we all collaboratively worked to try to turn this into something intelligible, fun, interesting, um, and so forth. And so, again here, I want to think about the, in the relevant unit of analysis is not simply um, me and the head uh, narrowly defined, but rather this whole um, staged uh, assemblage and the kinds, again, the kinds of capacities for action, the kinds of agencies um, that it made possible. And I think that a lot of really exciting work uh, is going on in the area of uh, media arts and design. Uh, and I, and I, I, I take the example of Sha Jin Wei's um, work. I could have taken many, many other examples. He does, he works on responsive environments. Um, this is a, a particular piece of his called the Tea Garden where you have costumed uh, dancers in a responsive space where uh, their movements and the sensors on their costumes interact with the sensors in the space to create very kinds of rich effects. But what I most love is the way that Jin Wei himself uh, conceptualizes, articulates the agencies um, of this uh, installation. Uh, and in particular, um, the kind of non-AI-based uh, um, uh, approach that he takes. So he says, the tea garden software tracks gesture rather than recognizes gesture because at no place in the software is there a model that codes the gesture. The software does not infer what the player means by her gesture. It merely tracks the gesture and continuously synthesizes responses. So what we've done is to set aside entirely the problem of inferring human intent from behavior or more generally from observables. Yet, by providing and even thickening the sensuous responses, we make fertile the substrate for agency, a sentence which I like very, very much. This approach remains agnostic as to whether movements are intentional. The responsive system simply doesn't need to know. So what I like about this is it feels to me like a, an approach that respects the particularities of the, 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 the particular material, materialities, the particular uh, capacities for action of the technologies that Jin Wei is working with um, and of the bodies that he's working with. And rather than trying to create uh, kind of human-like uh, replicas um, or, 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 or respondents to his dancers, he basically lets the humans and the machines each do what they're good at doing, but by combining them into a new configuration together, new kinds of agencies are possible. And I think that's very exciting and, and is a, a way of thinking uh, that, that is, is much more um, widely applicable. Um, so, uh, just to summarize before I give you a, a small coda, um, the argument that I want to make is that we, on the one hand, first of all, recognize our own, uh, our own participation in constituting in any, at any given moment when we're engaged in research or we're interacting with technologies in constituting the relevant unit, uh, units of analysis, that, that our analyses recognize both uh, the boundaries that we necessarily have to draw and that we are accountable for the decisions that we make at any particular time about how we're going to draw those boundaries because they're not inherently given, they're made, made. Um, and that we think about our analyses in terms of understanding both those frames and what happens when we look outside them um, and, and, and extend uh, to the kinds of contextualizing um, uh, investigations that we can do, again, to understand a particular um, configuration. Uh, and I want to close um, with a current uh, project of mine at Lancaster. Uh, we, we just applied for some money for a seminar series under this heading um, of Warfare and Healthcare, Action at a Distance and Bodies in Contact. What we're interested in is looking at ways in which uh, initiatives to project um, to develop technologies that enable the projection at, 
uh, of action at a distance in both domains of, of military and healthcare technologies on the one hand, and the continued uh, relevance, the con continued salience of embodied co-presence um, on the other. And I want to just read you, uh, give you a couple of, um, of, of stories um, to, to set uh, the context for this. Okay, so story number one. A young, a young man sits at a kitchen table in Toronto, Canada, telling his story. He is absent without leave from the United States Army, one of approximately 200 who have crossed the border into Canada since the Iraq War began seeking refugee status. Recruited through what's been named the poverty draft, he was promised relief from student loans, technical training, respect, and lifelong benefits as a veteran. Signing up in 2005, he found himself faced with the prospect of deployment to Iraq in the spring of 2007. What precipitated his flight to Canada was not simply that prospect, however, which he recognized as an inevitable consequence of his enlistment. Rather, it was the specifics of what he would be ordered to do once deployed. Imagining himself as a helicopter technician specializing in the operation of sophisticated navigational equipment, he found himself instead being trained to break down the doors of Iraqi homes, searching for anti-US insurgents. Asked if he would have been prepared to engage in helicopter combat missions more readily than in house-to-house -house search, he pauses and thinks. That's an interesting question. You have to understand, I was raised on video games. While the immediacy of invading a stranger's house feels unbearable, he concedes, Warfare at a distance, however lethal, feels more like a game. Second story. In a small house in Liverpool, Liverpool, England, an elderly woman sits staring out of her window. She wonders about making a cup of tea, but she doesn't stir. Somewhere in a call center, an alarm goes off, indicating that she hasn't opened the fridge for many hours. A phone call is triggered automatically through to her house. She struggles to the phone to hear the voice say that she must press one if she is okay, but she just replaces the receiver and waits. The phone rings again. This time a call operative asks her by name if she is okay, and a conversation begins. So these, uh, the, the second uh, of these stories comes from a project um, that my colleagues are doing on, uh, on telemedicine and, and telecare for, for elderly people and particularly um, the creation of various kinds of monitoring uh, arrangements um, that, that are connected um, to call centers, centers. And this is one of the observations um, that they made during their field work. And what joins these stories together, I think, is this promise uh, on the one hand of a kind of safety and security um, for those of us who uh, we are identified with um, on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, um, the, the, again, the, the, the on the ground realities in both domains of the ways in which uh, embodied co-presence continues um, to, be, uh, to be important um, and essential. Uh, and, uh, this is becoming uh, quite an issue, and I think you'll hear more about this in Noel Sharkey's uh, closing plenary, um, because there is a huge, uh, as many of you probably know, um, new round of initiatives in uh, the development of remotely controlled uh, forms of war fighting. So we have drone aircraft uh, that are controlled through interfaces um, based in the United States, um, where there are arguments now within the military about what qualifications are really required to be a drone pilot. The Air Force arguing that you still need to be a trained military pilot. You're, you're flying an aircraft um, in a war zone. Um, and others arguing that actually what you really need are skills that are developed through um, through video game play uh, from an early age and that you don't actually have to be um, a pilot. Um, in the area of robotics, we have um, robots that have previously been used for things like surveillance, for inspecting possible uh, IEDs, um, which are now being armed. So, where the, so the scenario is that we can 
we, um, the ones that the bodies that we're that we're concerned about, can be uh, at a safe distance operating um, these armed robots through remote control. There are huge issues that arise, of course, of how you recognize uh, the situation uh, at the at the, at the site in which the the robot is operating. Uh, how you uh, discriminate between friendly and unfriendly. Um, other bodies uh, and so forth. Uh, again, I think this is an area um, where we need a lot more understanding of the implications of these, uh, these developments. Um, I think we can think about the suicide bomber poignantly as in some ways a kind of uh, response to this on the part of people who don't have access to these kinds of technologies. And are we, gonna, are we facing a situation of increasing polarization where the more we attempt to keep our bodies safe, um, the more others um, are going to be prepared to turn their own bodies into uh, the technologies of, of, um, that, that, are, that are required uh, in order to try to, to counter um, in the area of healthcare, um, this, these are a couple of frames from a really wonderful uh, Dutch documentary called Robot Love um, about uh, experiments introducing robots into um, elder care situations. Um, I, I don't have time to go into them in detail, but these two frames are both from very, uh, very interesting um, scenarios. I'll just tell you briefly about the, the a project to uh, provide IBO um, robot dogs to elder people, um, and there's a, a moment in the and, and they took to the to these um, robot dogs um, with great enthusiasm, uh, became very attached to them. Uh, but there's a very, I think, mo the most telling moment in the documentary shows one of the researchers going down the hall of the apartment building uh, where the research subjects um, live, and she knocks on the door of one of the subject's apartments, and this woman opens the door, and she says, oh, I'm so glad you came, his tail fell off. And you see the researcher go and reattach the tail. Now, this goes by without any commentary in the documentary, but to me, this is a little reminder of the actual infrastructure that's required to keep um, these autonomous creatures operating. Um, and, and, and that if we forget about that infrastructure, we're deluding ourselves, um, again, into thinking uh, that, that we can project this kind of agency uh, without all of the associated uh, ongoing uh, labors that, that provide the kind of, the kind of continuity and, and the sustainability of it. And on the other hand, I think that there are tremendous possibilities um, in the area of elder care, and a lot of people here are, are working in that area, um, for bringing in uh, various uh, practice-based studies, participatory design, to think creatively about how um, bits of uh, automation, interesting bits of automation, including robotics, could actually be incorporated into the lives of, of older people. But very importantly, I think those projects have to be done in consultation with older people, their caregivers. Again, the unit of analysis um, has got to be um, a, a wider one. Uh, so I will end um, with this uh, simple uh, quote from Karen Barad, one of uh, my favorite. Uh, Karen Barad is a, a, a physicist um, uh, and, and uh, a feminist philosopher of, of science. Uh, she has a wonderful book called Meeting the Universe Halfway, um, and she has this lovely quote, uh, agency is not an attribute, but the ongoing reconfigurings of the world. Thanks. So Lucy is willing to take some questions. I notice there's only one microphone in the room, which is over there. So if those of you who would like to uh, ask some questions or make some comments on uh, her remarks, if you could go to this microphone and uh, say who you are and where you're from, and then make your comment. Hello, I'm John Riedel from the University of Minnesota. You touched on a number of really interesting ethical issues in your talk, just to call out three of them. One is, 
is it appropriate for us to turn over the care of our older people to robots? Another is, what happens if we build video game interfaces so that war feels like a video game? What kind of people then go to war and how do they carry out that war? And then a third is, what happens when we really have a science of building interfaces that lets us build completely compelling and addictive interfaces, such as the video game, inter the uh, um, gambling interface that you showed? And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how you think about our responsibility as scientists to deal with those issues of the interfaces we build. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, I think in terms of the, the robots and elder care, um, I mean, my main concern there is that it's a fantasy. Um, not, not a fantasy that there could be some place for, for robots um, even effectively, but, um, but if, I mean, any of you who have any experience um, with the kinds of practicalities that are involved in caring um, for, for a, an older person or, or people who need that kind of care, it's like the, the worst possible application domain for robotics because it's completely open-ended, indeterminate, full of all sorts of, um, of, of sort of mixed uh, kinds of, of, uh, of skill requirements and so forth. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm most concerned about is that um, there's something about the idea uh, I mean, not surprisingly, you know, we, we have a, a discourses about the growing popu aging population, uh, how, are, how are people going to be cared for, there's going to be a shortage of labor. Um, so I think that discussion has to change. Uh, robots are not going to be the solution there. Um, hu humanoid robots are not going to be the solution there. Uh, and so that's where I think it's a kind of media intervention that we really need. Um, uh, around uh, the ways, and because the media is in love with this idea and really propagates, there are a lot of media reports that propagate this this sort of idea that we're going to have robot caregivers. So, so I think we need some sort of critical interventions there that say, look, there's there there are many possibilities for interesting sorts of configurations of robotics in elder care, but the humanoid robot caregiver is just not, you know, <laughs> not the direction that's realistic to go in, right? Um, and so I always, when people worry about, well, you know, would we want to have a robot taking care of our loved ones? Like, I'm like way, way before that question. I mean, if I really thought there was a robot that could take care of my loved ones, then I'd engage with that issue. Um, but I think, you know, the questions come up way, way before that. But, but, um, the, but the other two that you suggested, we do know how to do, and it's a question of ought we. Pardon? The, the, the other two that you've suggested are things that we okay, do. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so in terms of, yeah, I mean, what I worry about with the, with the, with the, um, you know, what I think is an increasing uh, military entertainment um, complex here um, is that, uh, you know, these things are already happening massively. I mean, the, the drones are a major part of the, of the military. And I think that we, there we just really have to think about what, um, and, and there are people thinking about this, again, you'll, you'll hear more about this from, from Noel Sharkey, who started the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. Um, you know, what are, how does this change the dynamics of war? How does this intersect with um, doctrines about just war and, and so forth? Those are the things that I think uh, we need to be engaging with um, there. And then the final uh, question was about about the gambling that you showed. Oh, the gambling, yeah. I mean, again, there, I think there's nothing intrinsically evil um, about that. Um, the whole question is what, what's the political economy of, uh, of, of the gambling industry and who are the, you know, that, that's where I think we have to be, that's the, the kind of analysis um, that I think we have to be doing there. Uh, you know, who's benefiting, who, um, who's getting enrolled in this kind of, uh, in, in the zone, uh, who are, and, and Natasha Shul makes it clear that the people who are are generally people who are, you know, escaping from the rest of their lives, which are not as rewarding as they should be. So, and and I think there it's it, you know the technology again it it's all in the it's all in the configuration in the larger political economic relations that that that's where the critical questions are. Hello, I'm Ophelia Mangin from New York University, and you talked about all these different reconfigurations. You 
Uh, you didn't really address the temporal reconfiguration that might be associated with this, and I'm curious that as researchers, both involved in the production and the consumption side of the introduction of these different technologies, how we might be able to um, sort of in some ways wrap our heads around how we can intervene when we feel it's necessary, whether it's towards some end of positive social action or whether it's in terms on the production end insofar as placing something into the world and being able to sort of get, get a sense of where it's going to go in the direction to mm -hmm. make sure that what we're creating doesn't have some sort of negative ramification mm -hmm. that we that we don't want it to. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are hard questions, and I think, you know, lots of people here are sort of wrestling with these questions. And, and I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's, you know, there's, there's no way of controlling what happens um, with the things that we create. Uh, we know that. So I think what we can do is just stay connected. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things um, I think is important is to understand your own location in this, you know, within this whole terrain of technology production. You know, where are you? What is that? What kind of capacities for action does that give you? What does it make really difficult? Um, how, how can, you know, I think we, we really need to acknowledge the ways in which our particular locations are consequential for what kinds of priorities we have, what kinds of accountabilities we have, and so forth. And then we have to just try to stay connected with, with what's happening and, and comment on it, you know. Um, again, we're not going to be able to control it, but we can be, that, that doesn't mean we should just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, then we're not responsible. We can still stay connected, engaged. I mean, I've been thinking about starting a blog, but I haven't gotten around to it. Just tracking media representations of robots. I mean, I just think there's a huge amount to be done in just kind of commenting on the ways in which robots, particularly in military and healthcare applications, are, are represented in the media and, and the ways in which I think they're mystified and, uh, and, and they make it actually much more difficult for people to, to understand what's going on rather than, than, than clearer. And so, you know, I think there are multiple modes of engagement um, depending on where you are and what the challenges are that, uh, and, and then of course you can do, you know, whatever you can do to get yourself into a location that lets you do the kind of work you want to do. Just exercising our agency. Thank you. <laughs> um, Alex Taylor, Microsoft Research. Um, you raise a couple of things that uh, really interest me at the moment, um, infrastructure and warfare. Um, and obviously there are various people in Kai at the moment who are thinking about those things. And I've got two questions related to that. One of the things that I struggle with is empirically, how do you start to address those kinds of things that are of such a different scale to the things we're familiar with at Kai? Um, the other is you also refer to Donna Haraway's ideas about configurations and um, what role do we play in that? And I think, I mean, for me at least, I, I want to participate in the sorts of things that Haraway talks about theoretically. And I don't see, I, I see Kai sort of struggling with those ideas about actually building things that start to intrude on and sorts of question the ideas that we have around sort of the moral qualities of machines, et cetera. And do you think Kai has a role in that sort of work? Um, well, again, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to both recognize the, the, the ways in which where we are, it, it makes certain things possible and it makes other things really difficult. And, um, you know, at least my experience um, being at, at Xerox Park um, was there were certain things that it was really good to think about and other things that were placed sort of out of, out of the frame of, of relevance. Um, and, that's something that you either, you either if, you, if you're in those locations, you, you try to navigate your way around, you try to find other, other, other me, means through which you can engage in the things that are not directly relevant, um, or, you, or you try to move yourself to a place where, where you can you can do other kinds of work, um, you know. But I, I don't think there's any like perfect place to be, um, and I think, and, and nor do I think that you know there's any place that will allow any individual to sort of address all of these issues in, in the perfect way. I mean, the, your question about the kind of empirical questions around um, the military, 
Uh, you know, I think that's a, a very, I certainly feel that as a, as, as a great challenge. I'm not sure how I would actually go about uh, engaging in empirical work in that area. Um, but of course, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of us are involved in, um, in related kinds of, of technological development. So if, if we're designing video games, uh, for example, you know, we might have a really good sense of uh, what the sort of extent and limits are of, of the, the sorts of renderings and connections of those sorts of renderings to the, to the worlds that they're um, referring to. I mean, video games are wonderfully self-contained. Um, drone interfaces are, are very, very different in that regard, and there may be things to, to say about that. Michel Baudouin Lafont, Université Paris Sud in Paris, France. Um, I would like to ask you if the, the, the work uh, you've done on these configurations that involve humans and machines uh, help you better understand what, is, what it means to be human, uh, and in particular, uh, whether this definition changes with uh, technologies. Uh, the discussion on robots and on uh, warfare and all that seems to indicate that there are things that are uh, okay to transfer to machine agency and there are things that maybe are uh, mm. sort of mm. Mm. Uh, beyond the boundary. So mm. I don't know if you can speak to this. Right. I, I think it's not so much that, first of all, I mean, absolutely, I think what we're talking about here are how, what kinds of delegations do, what kinds of redistributions are we doing? So if, you think, if we think back to the anesthesia example, you know, what we're doing constantly here is we're we're configuring different distributions of agency. And one of the you know, most important developments in science and technology studies has been a, a, a radical kind of reconsideration of, of, of the human um, and, a, and arguments that, 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 you know, part of the reason that I, I, my critique of humanoid robotics has been that I think it's based on a really old fashioned view of what it means to be human, which is that you are a self-contained autonomous individual agent. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the other work that we're doing and that's happening in STS is arguing, look, humans don't work that way either. We are not autonomous, you know, bounded, uh, fi we don't have fixed boundaries, we're not. Uh, and that I think is, is the, you know, one of the most exciting developments and, and is very consistent with what's going on here. So, I mean, there was this wonderful moment in the session yesterday on, on skin put when someone asked, um, you know, how does it feel to be a button? Or what does it mean to be a button? And, and I think it's exactly that question of how have we thought about bodies, technology, what happens where? Um, how are we reconfiguring that? What are the implications of that, Do, you know? It, it, are those things that we want to be doing? Uh, and um, those are the kinds of questions I think we have to keep asking. We're always, we're always transforming those boundaries. We're always shifting the distributions. And, and that's why, you know, I think our unit of analysis has, so what is, it, what is the person I interface drone um, assemblage? What, what does that mean? Uh, what are the implications of that? I think that's what we've got to be worrying about, basically. Austin Henderson. Um, I'm not sure I can ask this question, but I'll try. Um, when you, the concern with reconfigurations is you challenge us to address that, address that as we are designing if we believe that the design keeps going and the design keeps happening in use, mm -hmm. then the concern with reconfiguration happens throughout the use and is, becomes potentially a subject matter of the engagement and the usage itself. Mm -hmm. And so it's the reflective question of what's your view or how do you think about reconfiguration as part of the subject matter? Right. Um, I mean, absolutely, I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons that I really like the word reconfiguration, as I should have mentioned, is that it also is a, it's a term of art in, in technology development and systems engineering. It's, you know, it's a completely familiar um, concept. And, uh, and, 
and um, you know, I think this ties in with all of the uh, the issues that have led us to be engaged in more and more uh, with more and more concern with designing for continual, uh, ongoing. Uh, customization, transformation, end user redesign, uh, participatory des design, and so forth. Um, because uh, you know, it's it's not that that we as designers configure things and then um, other people use them. It's it's that all of those, each of those engagements, um, is is itself creating particular kinds of configurations and and reconfigurations with greater and lesser difficulty and pain and, and so forth. So um, so I think this is very consistent with the you know the, the now quite long standing history of of <coughs> concern with with what's still a very difficult problem. I mean in, again in the infrastructure panel yesterday there was a lot of discussion about how you uh, actually create infrastructures that are are available for reconfiguration in the ways that they have to be in order to be sustainable. Um, and that's, you know, if we, for, I mean, I've done a little bit of, of work in relation to organizational um, uh, information systems and, you know, the, it, it immediately leads you to the question of not just, you know, how is this technology going to survive, but who, how, how does the organization have to be rearranged such that the humans will be around who are needed in order to make this sustainable, and, and so and what do you have to do in the in in the technology to enable all absolutely of that? give people the hooks that they can then Bingo. use absolutely yeah thank you Thomas Schluchter, UC Berkeley. Um, you mentioned this very interesting point that we um, get immersed in our interactions with interfaces to technology up to the point that we forget their existence until something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the epistemological difference between our interactions with interfaces and our interactions with objects, with physical objects, and whether a similar mechanism of forgetting about them and remembering them when things go wrong also goes on when we interact with physical objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think. I mean, I think interfaces are physical objects, of course, um, but uh, but but yes, I think this is a, a larger observation about um, about our relations with with objects, either digital or or not, or made of other materials with other kinds of dynamics. And uh, I mean, the the very early points that I made about familiarity, I think, are absolutely absolutely crucial. I think, you know, if, uh, again, it's, um, you know, I don't think that, uh, that, that there's anything inherent in either us or our objects that makes them either, you know, ready to hand or, or uh, transparently usable or in, in our, <laughs> in our faces. Um, it's all in the relationship. And as, as we, uh, really incorporate our objects of, of whatever kind into our practices, they, they disappear and then, you know, they variously re, um, represent themselves uh, depending on, on what kinds of com complications or difficulties arise. But I, I think that argument applies across um, differently materialized objects for sure. Okay, well, I'd like, to thank, I'd like to thank you, Lucy, not just for your remarks today, but for a whole career of contributions that have so enriched our understanding of the relationships between people and technology, and we look forward to continuing enrichments on your behalf. Thank you.
i should i should also say that that all of these arguments about technology apply to people as well and my own agencies and capacities for action are tremendously indebted to this community so i really appreciate this recognition thanks